welcome back. And we are happy to be joined again by Professor Mark Labar for his second lecture on the topic of equality, titled A Classical Liberal Conception of Equality. Professor Labar. Thanks, Jason. Uh, hi, folks. Uh, welcome back. I'm going to do a really brief overview of what I talked about uh, in my first lecture. Um, so uh, there'll be some details missing, but I hope to get you up to speed with what I hope to do here. Uh, what we did in the first lecture is look at Rawls, John Rawls, very influential understanding of social justice uh, as sort of the inspiration for contemporary egalitarianism. Uh, and as I indicated, there's really two forms of egalitarianism that have received a lot of defense in recent decades, uh, both of which in some way are a response to Rawls. Uh, one's called luck egalitarianism. We looked uh, briefly at sort of the basic motivation and some of the core arguments of luck egalitarians. Uh, and then there's democratic egalitarianism, which we haven't said much about um, at all. So we look at the primary concern of luck egalitarians as to Rawls view uh, and at luck egalitarianism's response to that concern. So succinctly put, it's that Rawls doesn't treat us as sufficiently responsible for our lives. His account of social justice um, treats our lives as sort of products of institutions without our having uh, an appropriate degree of responsibility for them. Uh, consequently, although I didn't bring this point out last time, um, one criticism is that the structure of his view encourages us to export responsibility for our lives and especially the choices that we make on to other people. To get around that, luck egalitarians distinguish between what they call brute luck that we have no control over and option luck which is luck with respect to uh, the outcomes from choices that we make. And uh, luck egalitarians hold us responsible only for the latter, not for the former. The former is really what it's the project of social justice to ameliorate. So what I'm gonna do in this lecture is look at democratic egalitarianism, which is uh, a later theoretical response to Rawls and to luck egalitarianism, uh, look at the objections that democratic egalitarians raise, and then look at the alternative that luck egalitarians offer. Um, following that, I'll look at some concerns about democratic egalitarianism itself, and I'll, I'll offer an alternative conception of equality, uh, argue that this is the way that we should see each, other's, uh, each other as being equals, uh, for lack of a better term, we can call this conception equality of authority. Uh, I will be saying just a little bit about it, not very much at all in this session, enough hopefully to sketch the idea, give an idea of what it looks like, but I'll be fleshing it out um, in the next two lectures quite a bit more in the lecture that I give on rights um, in coming days. Um, and so I'll look at that and then um, that will kind of do it for the lecture part of today. So as I mentioned at the end of the last lecture, there is no definitive the luck egalitarian view. There are numerous uh, variants and the differences between these variants are themselves the topic of debate amongst proponents of luck egalitarianism. What I'm wanting to bring forward now are some general and presumably deeper criticisms about the very idea of luck egalitarianism. Uh, they're gonna be pointed at specific forms of luck egalitarianism, but I think uh, there are either, either those uh, themselves hold amongst other variants or they have analogs uh, that can be appropriated to those variants. So I'm gonna start actually with the broad thrust of the democratic egalitarian critique of luck egalitarianism. And simply put, the idea is that luck egalitarianism has gone off the rails uh, in a serious way with concerns for social justice. And there were questions last time about the tie between uh, equalities of value and social justice. Uh, democratic egalitarians take that tie to be very deep indeed. And that's actually one element, uh, one premise 
in their critique of luck egalitarianism that nothing that luck egalitarians has to say really has anything to do with a historical concern of, of um, those who are concerned about social justice, which is emancipatory struggles. It's with uh, relieving injustice that's caused by oppressive social structures. Um, that is where social justice has been on the outlook of democratic egalitarians from the start. And the fact that luck egalitarianism has nothing to, to say about oppression per se is for them uh, a mark that something has really uh, gone wrong. So that's really the underlying thought of democratic egalitarian critiques of luck egalitarianism. And then on the other hand, it's sort of the primary concern that democratic egalitarians themselves appeal to in developing a positive. And I'll try to lay that out here in a few minutes. I do want to start with some more detailed critiques that they offer, though, of luck egalitarianism. And this first one seems to me to be quite important. And that is, as I've indicated, that in generating a critique based on responsibility of the Rawlsian view of social justice, luck egalitarians lean on a distinction between what Dworkin calls brute and option luck. Uh, and that distinction is uh, necessary in pretty, or does some work in pretty much anything that is appropriately deemed a view of luck egalitarianism. And democratic egalitarians argue that that distinction cannot bear anywhere near the theoretical weight it has to bear, which is fundamental for luck egalitarians. And there are two kinds of problems here. First is that the distinction depends on a controversial or problematic question about whether or not we actually have free will. If the idea in the distinction is that there are some outcomes over which we exert, which are products of our choices and others which are not, uh, that assumes that we actually have choice in some way that sort of the notion of free will tracks as being something other than itself, purely the product of causal forces playing them out through our lives. And whether or not that's true is a deep and very, very hard philosophical question. I don't know that there are questions that are any harder. It's also very old. Versions of this question go back to Plato. Um, so if we can't really arrive at consensus on that point um, philosophically, do we want to have a conception of social justice that's grounded on a very problematic answer to that question? It's very difficult to understand how we can have free will of the sort that we're responsible for in a world in which um, we're just products of antecedent causes. So one issue is the dependence of the crucial distinction on that very, very hard philosophical problem. A second is a practical problem. Uh, in a given case of a bad outcome, luck egalitarianism instructs us that we need to distinguish between brute and option, uh, and option luck because uh, society has, and concerns for social justice, really matter only for issues of brute luck, not for option luck. But that requires then that a determination be made in particular cases of whether or not it's brute or option luck that's involved. And democratic egalitarians argue, I think with some plausibility, that that's going to require an intrusive and disrespectful bureaucracy inserting itself into people's lives into ways that is highly undesirable and itself uh, possibly unjust. So making this distinction work as a matter of policy is um, just really not feasible, can't be done. So that's one problem. Here's a second problem, and some luck egalitarians have engaged this, I think, with varying degrees of success. We can call it the starting gate problem, although different problems go under that name. Uh, at least, for example, in Dworkin's uh, resource egalitarianism, the idea is we equalize people's resources and then uh, they get to use those resources to live their lives as they will. They're responsible for their choices, but not for outcomes of brute luck. For option luck, bad outcomes of option luck, they are responsible, not society. That's the whole idea of, uh, of expecting people to be responsible for their choices and not exporting the costs of their bad decisions onto other people. But now consider a case uh, like this, a case of the unlucky motorcyclist. This unlucky motorcyclist decides one day to go for a ride without a helmet just because it's such a nice day, crashes, has extensive brain damage, 
and uh, effectively uh, ruins his life in virtue of that uh, motorcycle crash. But look, that bad outcome is the product of bad op uh, option luck. He chose to go riding without a helmet. He chose to go riding in the first place. That's option luck. Society isn't on the hook for rectifying that. Society owes that guy nothing by way of justice in order to cope with the misfortune that his life has meant. Has meant. And democratic uh, egalitarians find that a highly offensive um, result to get in cases like that. But that's what happens when you hold people responsible for their option luck. A third problem we can call talent slavery, and this again, I'm going to illustrate this with uh, Dworkin's uh, resource egalitarianism. We mentioned that on that view, people are entitled to equal bundles of resources, where resources include everything from wealth and so on to personal capacities, mental and physical. And the idea here is that if your bundle is equal to everyone else and you're gifted with some great talent, maybe you're, you have Einstein's genius or you have the gifts to be uh, 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 an orchestra leader of uh, the first order. Um, those talents are going to count in your bundle and you're going to get correspondingly fewer resources uh, outside those talents, but that sort of confines your options. If you want to be an orchestra leader, that's great. Um, but if you have those talents and they count as part of your bundle of resources and for example, you then don't get as much by way of intelligence or uh, um, financial resources or something like that. Essentially, the only way for you to make a decent life for yourself is to serve those talents. And this argument then claims that people are enslaved by their talents. They really have no choice but to uh, pursue and develop their native abilities because those are the only resources that, uh, that they have in their bundle. So they're slaves to the natural talents that they have. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. Uh, democratic egalitarians find it striking that, uh, especially in Dworkin's version uh, of the view, um, the test for understanding how uh, bundles of resources are equalized is an envy test. You think, really? Should we be having a, uh, a conception of justice and of equality that's grounded in our capacity to envy what other people have? Uh, that seems problematic. This point actually, I think is, since this is the flip side of the luck egalitarian critique of Rawls is especially striking, that luck egalitarianism incentivizes denial of responsibility for problems. So think back to our motorcycle case. Uh, imagine just that it's not catastrophic, but it's a bad problem. And now imagine trying to understand society's burden of dealing with the costs of the motorcyclist's injuries. Well, the incentive for the motorcyclist is to push responsibility off of himself and say, hey, this is just bad brute luck. If it's option luck, I'm on the hook for it. If it's brute luck, society will bear the costs. So there's a big incentive to export responsibility for our choices to try to argue that what really is option luck, we should take or other people should take as brute luck so that we can get compensated for it. And that's an ironic sense of um, incentives uh, given um, the ambition of luck egalitarianism to be sensitive to responsibility in the first place. I want to add this last point, which I can call the production problem, that luck egalitarians really pay no attention to the interaction between distributions and the production that produces the resources or objective goods that are being distributed. This is a criti uh, critique that goes back to Nozick and Robert Nozick uh, in Anarchy, State, and Utopia and his critique of Rawls, that uh, the resources that are being subjected to these tests for redistribution are treated as manna from heaven. They're just there. And now we have to decide what to do with them. And Nozick's criticism was, guess what? They're not just there. Uh, we have to bring them about, and we better think about how we are going to be, how, how our decisions about distribution are going to be affecting production, um, or we're going to have severe problems. And I think that problem uh, issue carries through untouched, at least in uh, many versions of luck egalitarians. There's no question as to where these things come from. They're, they're just there. So these and other considerations uh, motivate, motivate democratic egalitarians to think, Luck egalitarian is a big wrong turn. 
uh, in thinking about equality, we need to do something really different. In particular, we need to stop thinking about distributive justice, how we're distributing stuff, whether that's resources or welfare or capabilities or anything else that's on the menu of forms of luck, luck egalitarianism. Uh, and instead, uh, realize that that's just a mistake for thinking about basic questions about um, human relationships. It really is a matter of relations be between people. And for that reason, this view is often, often called relational egalitarianism, focus on relations with one another instead of stuff. Now, I'll get to this a little, in a little bit, but there's multiple forms of relational egalitarianism, so I'm not going to call it that. Uh, I'm going to refer to it as democratic egalitarianism. So democratic equality uh, focuses on hierarchy, focuses on addressing these traditional structures of uh, concern for social justice, oppressive power structures, inequalities of rank and status. Uh, two of the foremost uh, proponents of this, Elizabeth Anderson, is commonly credited with having really originated this line of thinking about equality with paper in uh, 1999. Uh, Scheffler's contributions coming later. This general strategy has a lot in common with uh, contemporary work and classical Republican thought, especially in its resistance to uh, inequalities of power and status. Uh, Philip Pettit is a proponent of that. I'm not really going to get into the Republican story here at all. So the focus of democratic equality is equal standing as citizens, entitled to make equal claims upon one another as citizens. But Anderson's view, this requires the democratic egalitarian to offer principles of collective willing. What are we together going to do? Uh, how are we together going to understand what valid claims we can make on one another? Um, and so the idea is a form of democratic community, as she says, realizing self-determination self by means of open discussion among equals with rules acceptable to all. So that's this kind of model of uh, uh, standing as, as citizens equally poised to uh, engage in deliberation about how our life together is going to be formed. And then the basic idea is to guarantee the conditions of freedom of each. That's Anderson's term. Again, those conditions of freedom are what enable us to stand as equals in society. What does a guarantee like that require? Well, obviously, it requires that we not accept, that we overturn relations of domination, exploitation, requires that we not accept cultural imperialism. Those are kind of off the table at the outset. Uh, one thing that's quite important, this is very important in Anderson's work, is that that is true for private relationships, not just, might be obvious if we think about uh, legal institutions such as slavery, but she thinks this also holds true in private relationships, for example, employment relationships in the family, not just uh, relationships grounded in political authority. But it involves more than that, not just resisting those things, but also providing the goods necessary to make that standing possible. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about those, but obvious candidates that come to mind are things like uh, access to health care, education, and so on. Uh, the objective, though, is not that we be equal with respect to those uh, resources to provide us for citizenship. Don't care about equality of wealth or income or luck or resources or anything else. Uh, democratic egalitarians reject the starting gate theory of the requirement of public provision of welfare goods. So thinking back to our unlucky motorcyclists, the fact that the motorcyclist made a bad decision and went riding without a helmet doesn't endanger his entitlement to standing as an equal. And in fact, more resources might need, need to be directed his way uh, in virtue now of the burden that he's under in order to enjoy that standing. So democratic egalitarianism requires that goods be provided uh, in a way sufficient to guarantee the capabilities of citizens to enjoy uh, those functions of uh, equal citizenship. That obviously puts in addition to food and shelter and so forth, puts education uh, as a very high priority. Uh, unlike luck egalitarians, uh, prominent democratic theorists, and here I actually have Anderson specifically in mind, also take the production of goods very seriously. So they do care about how goods are produced in society, partially because they want there to be enough goods, but also because they think that participation in the production of those goods is itself a social good. 
that uh, is part of the fabric of a democratically equal society. So Anderson says we're to regard the economy as a system of cooperative joint production. Uh, and the capacities to do, to do that, the capacities to produce are themselves an important component in the conditions of social freedom. So that again is part of the burden that society bears in is, is providing the resources for people to develop those capacities so they can contribute as uh, producers. And the flip side of that is then that uh, on democratic egalitarianism, we're responsible for doing so. So those who could uh, contribute but don't uh, have a problem with the requirements of justice of democratic, uh, democratic equality. Uh, they resist the somewhat infamous view of uh, uh, Philip von Brake that uh, surfers should be fed uh, even though they spend their days uh, surfing. We haven't talked about that view, I'm not going to say more about it, but democratic egalitarians don't want to have anything to do with that element. So there is a critique of democratic egalitarianism from luck egalitarians. There are actually multiple responses. Uh, but one that I think is worthwhile noting is that they turn the leveling down objection that we talked about last time back onto democratic egalitarianism. There's nothing about being democratic equals, they say, that requires that we be living good lives we could be democratic equals and be living miserable lives. And so one might think that the invitation of democratic egalitarianism is to level down uh, such that everybody is equal in ways that uh, rule out, say, hierarchies of power or rank, but as a result, everybody's miserable. And they say, yeah, that can't be right. It can't be right that we're valorizing a conception of equality that says, really, it's best if um, everybody is equally miserable. Um, that's not the concern. I'm not sure how apt that is or whether or not there are not good responses to that. I want to raise some dish, different issues. One that democratic egalitarians, and here I'm thinking mostly of, of Samuel Shuffler, themselves raise is that we seem to be able to have valuable relationships with others despite imbalances in power, rank, and status. So think, for example, there are lots of different uh, illustrations that we might think of but think of the relationship between a trainee or an apprentice in a craft and a master in that craft. They're not equal in power, they're not equal in rank, they're not equal in status, but it's really good and it's especially good for the apprentice or the trainee to be able to enter into that relationship because that is one way of acquiring skills that will allow him or her to, um, to acquire greater power, rank, and status through life. So Shepard notices this. These inequalities are themselves not all, not always bad things. And to put it in philosophical jargon, they're not unconditionally bad. They seem to be bad in some conditions, not bad in others. So if they're not always bad, does justice require that we eliminate them? That seems like an odd result. A deeper concern, this is now my concern for democratic egalitarianism, that it seems to have the same problem with relationships reflecting domination that democratic egalitarians worry that luck egalitarianism has with responsibility. If you recall, the concern there was that luck egalitarianism requires, seems to make necessary, um, a, a messy state bureaucracy that's intruding in people's lives to an offensive degree to determine whether or not option luck or uh, root luck is responsible for their bad outcomes. And here I think there's at least a live worry here that the same kind of bureaucracy is necessary to determine whether or not relations, uh, relationships and features of relationships are reflecting domination of an unacceptable form. And that's, uh, I think, every bit as um, vague and difficult to grasp uh, empirically concept as responsibility uh, is in the luck egalitarian case. For me, though, the deepest concern is this, that the duties of justice on democratic egalitarianism are owed to other people just as citizens, not as human beings. And that seems to me to be a really deep and important mistake. Uh, one implication is that on democratic egalitarianism, we do not seem to have duties of justice across national boundaries. So if you think back to my early tale of two children and the picture of Philip, the deeply impoverished Filipino boy, democratic egalitarianism seems to suggest that we don't have any requirements of justice bearing on us with respect to Philip. 
Uh, that seems to me deeply counterintuitive and in fact, just flat out impossible. So it seems to me that the, this points to a problem with grounding our fundamental requirements of justice in relatively shallow and contingent features of ourselves. And after all, our participation in membership in a given political society is a very shallow, uh, very contingent uh, feature about us. It's a function of where lines have gotten drawn on the, law, on the ground, which side of it we're born on, whether those lines move, what sorts of policies people want to adopt about moving across lines, very, very uh, remotely contingent features of our lives carry all the weight or carry, yeah, carry all the weight really with respect to the responsibilities that we have one person to another uh, of justice. That seems to me to be a huge mistake. So that seems to me to be as deep a problem as the democratic egalitarian problems uh, raised that the problems that the democratic egalitarians raised for lot of egalitarians. So I want to turn to a different form of relational egalitarianism that I claim does a better job uh, really on all those points, but certainly on the last one. And that's what I'm calling equality of authority. So equality of authority in a simple pithy formulation is equal standing or capacity to obligate one another. Uh, so what do I mean by authority to obligate? Well, I'll start with the notion of obligation, which is a familiar notion for people working in moral philosophy. Maybe outside, it's a little bit uh, more alien. The idea here is this, that we're obligated when we have moral duties or moral responsibilities to others and are accountable to them to fulfill those duties. So for a simple example, think about a case of promising. I promise to pick you up at the airport. If I promise to pick you up at the airport and you take me up on that promise, I now have a duty to you to pick you up at the airport. I am obligated to you to pick you up at the airport. And if I fail to show up, I'm accountable to you for not doing so. I owe you an explanation for why I didn't show up when I did. Maybe I owe it to you to pick up your Uber fare to get back into town. Lots of different things uh, can feed into accountability. Uh, but, and, and in, in, a, in any particular case, but what I'm after here is the basic model of duty and accountability. And that's what I'm thinking of as involved in obligation. So we have authority to obligate when we can put others or ourselves under such obligations. So promising is a case of putting ourselves under obligation. We have, insofar as we take uh, each other to be capable of promising and be held to our promises, uh, we uh, are treating each other as having that kind of authority. And then under some conditions, we can hold others responsible for obligations that they have to us. The basic idea of equality of authority is that uh, nobody can obligate anybody else in a way that cannot be reciprocal. Our capacity to obligate each other has to be equal, has to be mutual, has to be uh, reciprocal. So this form of equality is grounded in our relations with one another as moral beings, as beings that are capable of having authority, that are capable of undertaking obligations, that are capable of uh, responding to one another on the basis of reasons, of being reasons responsive agents. And that seems to me exactly where we ought to be. We think about our relationship with Philip. Uh, we have obligations of justice to him because we both satisfy this description. And that's all it takes to get obligations of justice up and running. We do not have to be citizens of any sort. It doesn't have anything to do with citizenship, membership in society, or anything like that. I would claim, I'll try to make this, uh, bring this point out a little bit in what follows, that this form of equality explains the condi conditional nature of the bads of inequality that democratic egalitarians are concerned with, where they're thinking about inequalities of power or rank or status. As we saw, sometimes those relationships are good. Not always, sometimes they're bad, sometimes they're horrible. What I wanna say explains the difference between those is the conditions under which inequalities in hierarchy or rank or status are okay are ones in which they're realized against the fundamental backdrop of uh, equality of authority. The ones in which they're bad are bad because they're occurring against a backdrop of inequality of authority. So I'm not going to be doing a whole lot more fleshing out of the idea in this lecture. Uh, as I said earlier, that's a, product, a project for my lecture on Friday. 
and then again on Sunday. But I do want to say something in closing this lecture about the historical roots uh, of this conception of equality. Um, the title of the lecture is uh, Classical Liberal Conception of Equality. And as far as I'm concerned, this is the cornerstone of classical liberalism. In fact, in my view, it's constitutive. Being a classical liberal just means accepting this as a fundamental moral principle. So I see it uh, expressed in the work of John Locke. Uh, so in Locke's two treatises of government, uh, he rejects, in the first treatise, he rejects uh, Sir Robert Filmer's uh, argument for um, the God-given right of kings and queens uh, to rule over their people. Uh, Filmer argues that by nature, God has made kings to be obeyed. Kings have a kind of authority and queens have a kind of authority that their subjects do not. And by nature, uh, God has deigned subject, uh, the rest of the people to be subject to that authority in a way that can't be reciprocated. So in the first treatise, Locke demolishes that uh, premise. In the second, he builds a theory of uh, what can legitimate government control that's grounded on that equality. And here's, what, here's the way Locke formulates the idea. Locke says, we must consider what state all men are naturally in. That is before we start forming political societies or doing anything else. And that is a state also of wherein all the power and jurisdiction is reciprocal. No one having more than another, there being nothing more evident than that the creatures of the same species and rank, promiscuously born to all the same advantages of nature and the use of the same faculties, should also be equal one amongst another without subordination or subjection. So Locke is also taken to be a protean source for uh, republicanism and in some ways for democratic uh, egalitarianism in virtue of his appeal to here to non-subordination or subjection. But I take it that Locke's key idea isn't power subordination or, or subjection, it's jurisdiction. And if you like, in Q&A, we can talk about that. I think his reliance on, reliance on consent uh, to basically make government legitimate uh, we can't make sense of that without thinking that is really Locke's focus. Uh, bit after Kant, or bit after Locke, century plus, uh, we get Immanuel Kant um, defending, I take it, a clear conception of equality of authority. In fact, I think he has an explicit formulation of equality of authority in his political work. Kant argues that a rightful political condition is one in which each is equal to each other in his or her capacity to obligate them. That's equality of authority. So I take Kant and uh, Locke to be sort of guiding lights in classical liberalism precisely in espousing uh, this notion of equality as being the guiding light for them in a just and legitimate political order. So conclusions I'm inclined to draw, that I would encourage you to draw. Uh, first, we are right to care about equality as an important political idea. Um, for a long time, in many cases, uh, people of a libertarian inclination have been inclined to say, well, liberty matters and equality not. I think that's a mistake. Uh, I think it's a mistake because there is a notion of equality that's central to the notion of classical liberalism. As it turns out, equality and liberty are tied together uh, they're joined at the hip in uh, both conceptions of Locke and especially of Kant. So it's a way of uh, taking equality to have the importance that many or most people think that it has, saying, yeah, but we got to zero in on what kind really matters, and that kind is equality of authority. Everything depends on that. If we are uh, understood to be talking about equality of wealth or income uh, or uh, distributional equality, uh, we're barking up a tree uh, that's not going to be productive. I think we should agree with democratic egalitarians that any form of equality of stuff is misguided, and that includes luck egalitarianism. And, and I should say, I mean, I've been critical of democratic egalitarianism here, but I give credit to the democratic egalitarians, and especially to Anderson, in really seeing a way clear of recovering important insights about equality that really got buried, um, beginning probably with Rawls, uh, and certainly carrying on through luck egalitarianism. To me, that seems like uh, a deep mistake, uh, one that's very difficult to recover. And so I think uh, I appreciate all the work that has gone into, uh, into exploring that mistake and trying to surmount it by a democratic egalitarians.
However, that said, I think democratic egalitarianism is still itself uh, misguided in some of the ways that I've indicated. I think equality of authority is a much more plausible, sounder uh, basis for thinking of ourselves as equal, not just as citizens, but as human beings. So that's the way that I think we have to go in thinking about equality. To say I'll be saying more about that on Friday and then again on Sunday. Uh, but for now, that's it. I'll stop and uh, Jason, take questions. Okay, Professor Labar, thank you. Great batch of questions. So first, what do you make of the concept of human dignity and how does it fit into this account? As it turns out, that's a really good question. Dignity is, uh, a, a, turns out, I think many of us think we know what it is when we see it, but it's very difficult to articulate what it is. Within the last 15 years or so, there's been a lot of work done by political theorists and philosophers on dignity. Uh, I, I, so I have enough Kantian roots in my thought uh, that I naturally think about it as Kant does. Uh, Kant thinks that dignity is a product of being able, uh, being a, the kind of creature that is capable of determining what it does on the basis of reason and not just the causal forces that are, plays, that are at play in us in virtue of our animality. So I think it's, uh, I, I don't have a clear cut account of dignity, but I think it ha I, I accept that Kantian insight and think that dignity has to be tied to this capacity that we have that I think I'm not a Kantian, but Kant has at points some beautiful and powerful insights. And uh, Kant has this passage, uh, not in his political works, but in the um, Critique of Practical Reason, where he says, and I'm, this is gonna be a paraphrase, this is two things uh, inflict a profound sense of awe every time I behold them. One is the starry skies above me and the other is the moral law within me. And I think what Kant is reflecting on is the idea that, look, we know more and more as science has delivered more and more insight into the causal order. Uh, at the time that Kant was writing, he was, he was living in a Newtonian, Newtonian world. He was deeply influenced by Newton. Um, and the idea that, you know, so he's awestruck when he looks at the stars, but then he thinks, yeah, but this whole world, stars and me in it, my brain, my body, all of that is governed by this core set of Newtonian laws, um, how can there be in this universe anything that has free will, anything that's capable of determining itself by reason, anything that's capable of feeling itself to be obligated? And he said, when I think that in all this expanse of the universe, the only things that we know that are capable of doing anything other than responding to the fundamental laws of physics is us. It's like, Whoa, that's a shock, that's a deep and profound and shocking insight. And that I think is where Kant think, thinks dignity rests. And insofar, I think that's roughly right for Kant. I agree with him. I think that's absolutely right. You look around the universe and there's something really, what we know of the universe, there's something different about us from everything else that we know in this universe. God, maybe, uh, if, you, if you believe in God, God may well be rational in this way. But that's something that, in considering the natural order as uh, natural as try to do, we discount. We can confine ourselves to things that we can observe. Um, no, we're alone. And that's, that's his argument for dignity. And that seems to me to be a really very powerful way of thinking about it, if it's not the only one. One participant notes that sometimes groups seem to be saying that suffering together is morally good and preferable in a way that might go beyond just solidarity. Um, so are there people who might seriously prefer a lower but equal quality of life? And if so, how ought we to respond to them? That's a good question uh, also. Um, and I suppose, I mean, one initial response is um, in what way or to what degree, what kind of life are you preferring? Uh, and I'm guessing that, um, so I don't know, I haven't seen those arguments myself. I've seen, so this is, that would be sort of an argument for leveling down. And the only place I've actually seen a defense, uh, any kind of uh, spirited or well thought out defense of leveling down is in the case of education. Uh, I haven't seen that one with respect to overall standards of living. 
if the argument is, uh, let's look back on how people were living uh, 10,000, 12,000 years ago when they were living in uh, small hunter-gatherer bands. Uh, and actually, now that I say that, I do know people who think it's true that people were better off uh, living like that. Um, I actually think those views are not touchable by argument. Uh, I think, really, if you really believe that living in a world in which women have 10 children so that they can have two that live and spend most of their adult lives in childbearing, where your entire life is consumed with warding off starvation, uh, where any kind of fluke of nature can kill you and everyone that you love. Uh, okay, I'm really not sure about what degree of commonality there is in terms of interest in people leave, living decent lives. I do appreciate the, in, the interest in solidarity, and I do think it makes sense to say, look, material prosperity is not all there is. That's absolutely the case. I'm an Aristotelian, and uh, in broadly speaking, and Aristotle paid great attention to how social relationships, including friendship and kinship and the polis, how important those were to living good human lives. So I don't think those two come at the expense of each other. Um, I do think that if maybe if maybe if I were presented with a, a hypothetical in which we had a choice between uh, a society of a really despotic uh, king who say could make us all live pretty good lives most of the time, but every year uh, demanded a virgin to throw into a volcano, um, that might be kind of a hard story for me to grasp. But I don't think we live in a world in which that's remotely plausible. We don't live in a world in which there is anyone among us who can do that for the rest of us. Uh, we don't live in a world in which in, in, uh, injustice really makes us, makes us, all of us, materially better off. I think that's demonstrably false. Um, so I'm not very tempted to think that there's a real question as to the hypothetical, conceptually possible world in which we're made better off by injustice. Um, I guess I would have to look at particular proposals as to how accepting some degree of loss of welfare could make us better off in other ways. I'm, I'm sort of skeptical uh, as to whether or not uh, in, in producing greater welfare uh, would have that requirement, but that's an argument that I'd be willing to, to think harder about. We've got a few questions about how this might relate to state structures. So the first asks whether democratic egalitarians can also be cosmopolitans. So could they accept your account and say that, for instance, they were just focused on equality within the state, but all of the normative claims that you're making still apply uh, outside the state. It's just not what they're interested in in, in their particular arguments. Right. Uh, so that's a great question uh, because it invites, uh, I mean, so one way to put my, what I said was my deepest criticism is that you, we can't be called, I am a cosmopolitan about justice. I think we owe, uh, duties of justice to everybody, irrespective of their um, uh, legal or political affiliations. And uh, one way of pushing back would be to say, uh, maybe there's a way to uh, unite cosmopolitanism in some kind of way with democratic, egalitarian, uh, democratic egalitarianism. Uh, I'm not an expert on democratic egalitarianism. I've looked for treatments of cosmopolitanism uh, and or, or that question in particular, and I have not seen uh, that question really taken up uh, uh, very seriously. And in fact, if anybody actually knows of that work, I would really appreciate hearing about it because I would like to look at it. Of course, one way you could go would be to say, let's just be democratic egalitarians, but let's think about a, cos a, a, a literally a, a cosmic political order. Let's think about a world government or a world society. Uh, and I think uh, that sort of formally solves the problem, because now if we're thinking about a world politic or a world society or a world something like that, world political group, um, we could say, okay, that solves the problem, bingo, now we do have those obligations as extending beyond, um, beyond the bounds of particular polities. But the costs, I think, uh, come right at the heart of the conception of the kind of life that democratic egalitarians 
wish us to have. So recall that there's an image there of us making claims on citizens as engaging in debate, uh, as engaging in um, collective willing, as engaging in, in a participatory way, in decision making according to rules that all of us can agree on. If you think, how difficult is it for 100 people uh, to come up with rules that they all can agree on, and you think, yeah, this is just not going to happen for 6 billion people. So I think the very model of democratic governance that democratic egalitarians sort of cherish as an ideal is it's, it's just, at least I can't imagine how that can be extended into uh, a one world sort of government, even though it would solve those problems. So it seems to me the tension there is really deep between realizable forms of collective self-governance and uh, duties across the bounds of that kind of governance and the bounds of those kinds of duties to reach out to our relationships with people and other polities. As I say, if, if anybody knows of good treatments of that, I would really like to see it because I haven't been able to find it. And by the way, if anybody does have resources like that and you want to drop them into the Q&A box, we will be sure to forward them along to Professor Labar. Uh, so relatedly, and this gets back to an observation that Jacob Levy made at our last seminar, that it's not an IHS seminar until anarchy gets mentioned. Um, does your view lead to anarchy in that uh, any sort of government structure is going to create inequalities in authority that might justify uh, doing away with the state altogether? So... 15 years ago at IHS seminars, we were supposed to avoid the A word. Um, that was too painful. And so, but uh, obviously Jacob has uh, caught the, the spirit of the moment. Um, yeah, not only do I think it's compatible with anarchism, I think actually it requires anarchism. And so I am an anarchist uh, in this sense that I do take equality of authority to be the paramount um, ideal of relations between people. And I think not only does government require inequalities of authority, it's premised on the, the, it, the sort of the very idea of legitimate government is a body or an individual or collection of individuals that have the unilateral authority to exercise force um, and sorry, to initiate force uh, and to exercise force sort of uh, in a legitimate way within some particular boundaries. That's inequality of authority. It is flat out uh, ruled out by equality of authority, except under special circumstances. So uh, I, I am going to be saying, so I'm not going to walk this back at all. I will be saying a little bit more in my rights talk and in my talk on civility. Uh, although I'm not pushing for anarchism because I actually don't know if, if I could push a button today and realize uh, a perfect anarchist world, I wouldn't do it in a heartbeat because I think things would go very bad very quickly. Um, so I'm not sure about the practicalities of this. I'm sure about the moral ideal than I am about what this means uh, for practice. But if you think about Locke's view for a moment, uh, so Locke starts out with political equality, with, sorry, with this equality uh, of authority, um, as I mentioned on the earlier, sli earlier slide, he's not going to end up an anarchist, he's going to end up actually legitimating uh, the authority of the English king and queen and the authority of the English constitution. Well, how does he get there? Well, we start out all equal, nobody having any authority over one another. And he says, yeah, but guess what? We can consent to others having that authority over us. And that indeed is a way of exercising authority. I do have authority over myself and I can obligate myself. I can say, uh, look, in fact, this is what I do when I promise to pick you up at the airport. I say, you tell me when your flight's coming in and you are obligating me to be at that airport. That's what my promise consists in. So there's nothing magical about the idea that we can obligate or ourselves or convey authority to others to hold us accountable for our obligations. And Locke says, yeah, guess what? We can do that. We can say, let's form together and convey this authority to this, to the legislative. And he thinks there's all kinds of advantages to doing that. We say, great story, Locke. How does that happen? Well, we give it our consent. Well, how does that work? Well, there's two forms. One is what he calls explicit consent, where I say, yeah, you know what? I consent. Let's do that. Uh, fair enough. But he realizes that most people don't do that. Uh, the vast majority of people who are living in any given polity give what he calls tacit consent. 
And he says, yeah, you give tacit consent just by being there and enjoying the benefits of the political regime. Uh, so he technically solves this problem. All of us in living here, just by continuing to live here, are consenting. And that means we've exercised our authority to permit government to do what it's doing within some bounds. That's really a stretch. The notion of tacit consent was bad when Locke wrote it. Uh, David Hume has a devastating, I think, to be a devastating critique of tacit consent 20 years after uh, Locke wrote it. Uh, if you take away tacit consent, the conclusion is that the vast majority, in fact, every political society that we know of is illegitimate. And uh, Locke scholars um, like John Simmons uh, have, uh, Simmons wrote a book called The Edge of Anarchy. And Simmons' argument is Locke's argument really leads to the conclusion that only anarchy is legitimate. The uh, idea of tacit consent is a fig leaf to cover that and to try to rescue the legitimacy of government. Um, it's not going to work. And so really Locke's argument is an argument for anarchism. And I, really, I think the logic of Simmons' reading of uh, Locke there is right. And so whoever's asking this question, yeah, I think you're getting the logic right too. Um, that leaves open lots of questions about what forms of social organization are appropriate and possible to realize uh, equality of authority. I think that's a real, but from my perspective, just as I said with, with Rawls, when uh, in the last session, uh, Rawls would really like the questions about what forms of society and institutions would be compatible with his principles. It's like Rawls thinks it's a win that we're asking those questions. Those are the right questions uh, for a philosopher to have brought to the surface. And I think probably as a moral philosopher, I'd be happy too if everybody is saying, okay, you're not so happy about government. Well then, um, what can we do to realize a society in which people are equal in authority? And my answer is, hell if I know, but boy, is that the right question? That's the, and it's a really important question. It's a really hard question, it's, but it's the right question to be investigating instead of going around worrying about how much money Jeff Bezos has. Short of anarchy, is there a system of, uh, of pure equality in politics that could be reached? And here I'm imagining uh, that the questioner is thinking of something like direct democracy. Uh, if that's not correct, drop, drop something in the Q&A. But uh, are there forms of more direct governance uh, that might look like might look different than the sort of uh, liberal democracy that we see today, but might still get toward the sort of organization that that you are uh, looking at here. Well, I'm going to interpret that as actually being, uh, or that question is having two angles. One is what forms might realize that I don't think. I mean, direct democracy does, if and only if it's unanimous, uh, right? So long as there's a minority that hasn't opted into those political arrangements, hasn't chosen to be subject to that authority. And as long as they're subject to that authority, independent of their willingness to be so, then no, it's a violation of equality of authority. So uh, as Locke himself recognized, if you can have unanimity, you don't need democracy. You don't need a political, you just people just agree to do what they need to do. And you don't need government. People just agree and off you go. Uh, so I'm skeptical about that. There's there might be another angle to this question though, and thinking, okay, given that, you know, I've just said, I don't have any idea of what, of, of what equality of authority would look like. Um, and this is a, a question that Simmons looks at. So I'll, I'll frame the question as Simmons says, look, by Locke's lights, all governments are, uh, are illegitimate. So does that really mean there's nothing to be said for say the government of Sweden as opposed to the government of, uh, of Iran or Venezuela, that seems crazy too. Uh, and so the way that Simmons wants to cope with that is to say, yeah, uh, legitimacy is one question, justification is another. By Lockean lights, those governments aren't legitimate. Even Sweden's government isn't legitimate, but there's a lot more justification for accepting the institutions in Sweden than there are in Venezuela. Um, and I think that is a sensible thing to do. I think we, we do care about uh, equality of authority. We also care about infant mortality plunging. We also care about people having enough to eat. So although I think it needs to be sort of the North Star for thinking about political justice or justice period, 
Um, I don't think it's the only value and that it makes sense to think of sacrificing anything else we care about, especially when we don't have a clear conception of what it was. If we knew what it was and knew how to do it and then didn't do it, that would be a different problem than just saying, okay, drop everything, let's overthrow every government that exists, uh, create anarchy, and then see what happens. I think what happens is going to be tragedy if we do that, which is why I wouldn't, why I said I wouldn't push that button. Until we know what that looks like and until people are ready to assume responsibility for bearing that authority, uh, which we don't have to do now. That's a big problem, I think, with uh, living under government. So we have time for one more question. And to do that, I'm gonna combine a couple of questions. We had so many re really good ones uh, for this lecture. So uh, for the grad students, if you have other questions, feel free to bring those up uh, at the social with Professor Labar. So what sort of positive obligations does human dignity place on us, both in terms of actions and then perhaps getting back to some of the sufficientarian concerns uh, in terms of actual goods? Uh, yeah, I think the positive obligations are not very many with respect to goods. I will be talking about that more on Friday. Maybe I mean, that question sort of anticipates the segue to thinking about rights. Uh, and, uh, and you may be able to anticipate where I'm going, going to go with rights. I don't think we do have positive obligations of justice to others with respect to other goods. I do think the sort of concerns of poverty, the concerns of sufficientarianism, uh, I think those are live moral concerns. And I think we do have obligations to others in light of poverty and in light of their need. I don't see them as obligations of justice. Uh, so the difference here is that obligations of justice, and this is where rights come in, are going to be obligations situated in these relations of accountability that I talked about earlier. Not only do I have an obligation to you, but you are entitled to hold me accountable um, for meeting those obligations. I don't think that holds when it comes to obligations of beneficence. This is a distinction that Kant draws between obligations of justice and obligations of beneficence, and I think it's real. I don't think obligations of beneficence are optional in some sense that you can sort of take them or leave them. I think if you're a decent person, you ought to be moved and you ought to see the need of others as uh, providing you powerful reasons to do things to ameliorate it. But I don't see that there's a relation of accountability there that makes that an issue of justice. But a, a great question for to develop the thoughts that I have there.